Welcome back to the Radio Signals channel. My name is Mark, N9WIB, and this is the Technician License Series with lecture number three. And today we're going to cover radio signal fundamentals. So the topics we'll cover today are radio waves and signals, frequency and wavelength, the radio spectrum, get into uh, the concept of phase, and also uh, end with a review of radio basics. A radio signal has essentially two components. It's the electrical energy that's produced by the radio within the radio, and also a radio wave that is created at the antenna and propagates or travels through space. And the energy that's produced is known as RF energy or radio frequency energy. The purpose of antennas are kind of twofold. So antenna essentially converts electrical energy from the radio into radio waves. So the radio produces a signal and that signal is sent to the antenna and the antenna converts it from electrical energy to radio frequency energy or a radio wave and transmits, transmits it throughout the airwaves. An antenna also functions as a receiver. So the antenna converts radio waves that uh, go through the air and space into electrical energy. And that electrical energy is routed back into the radio and is converted back to voice or Morse code or digital signals or whatever that the original signal originated as. In this example, we have two radios. Radio number one is acting as a transmitter and radio number two is acting as a receiver. So in radio number one at the transmitter site, the radio is going to produce electrical energy within itself, which is going to travel up the antenna and be converted to electromagnetic radiation or radio wave, which will travel through space to radio number two and be received by the antenna. So that radio wave will be converted into electrical energy by the antenna that will go back into the radio and be decoded. So in the next series of slides, we're going to cover radio wave properties. Radio waves travel fast, and we'll get into that in the next slide. They also have different properties of electrical and magnetic fields. They actually have both. We'll go into the property of wavelength. All waves have a certain length and a certain frequency. And they also have what's called polarization. But let's start off with how fast radio waves travel. So when we say that radio waves travel fast, how fast is fast? Well, radio waves travel the speed of light. And the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. So that seems like it's really fast. So let's have an example of how fast that actually is or how far that actually is. So how long does it take for a radio wave or light to travel between the Earth and the Moon? So between the Earth and the Moon, there is going to be a very rough approximate distance of 382 million meters. So if the speed of light is 300 million meters per second, and the distance between the Earth and the Moon is 382 million meters, we see that it would take probably a little over one second for light or a radio wave to travel between the Earth and the Moon. And to give you a little more perspective, we can have the Earth and Moon's distance uh, can fill approximately 30 Earths. So we can put 30 Earths between the Earth and the Moon. So what do we mean when we say that radio waves have electromagnetic properties? Well, they have an electrical field and a magnetic field. And as we can see on this graph, so this is going to be the x-axis, this will be the y-axis, and this will be the z-axis. 
and we can represent a electromagnetic wave in three dimensions. So let's say the wave is traveling and starting right here and traveling to the right. We can see that the wave has two fields that are 90 degrees to one, each other, to one another. So the light green wave is going to be the electrical field. And the other wave that is traveling 90 degrees or oriented 90 degrees perpendicular to the electrical field is going to be the magnetic field. So uh, the waves consist of both electrical and magnetic fields and are oriented 90 degrees from each other. But this encompasses one electromagnetic wave. As we reviewed in the previous slide, electromagnetic waves have both properties, electrical fields and magnetic fields. But for the purpose of simplifying things, a wave can be seen as uh, a depiction such as this. So we have the x-axis and the y-axis. And the wavelength can start at this point and then go to the right. And we measure wavelengths by either peak to peak, here to here, and that's considered one wavelength. Or we can also measure wavelengths by considering the trough to trough. Typical wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum are going to range from a very long wave of 10,000 kilometers for a frequency of 30 hertz, which we'll get into in a little bit. And that's, that's equivalent to the distance between Los Angeles and Rome. So that's one wave, and that one wave represents the peak-to-peak -peak distance or the trough-to-trough -trough distance. And the smallest wave in the electromagnetic spectrum that uh, we can consider right now would be um, about one millimeter, or less than the size of a grain of rice. And that corresponds to a frequency of 300 gigahertz. So waves are sinusoidal in nature, meaning they oscillate and go from top to bottom or positive to negative. And that distance from the top to the bottom is known as the amplitude. So if we take the height of the wave here and the bottom of the wave here, this distance d is going to be equal to the amplitude of the wave. Waves can vary in height or amplitude. As an example, let's take a different wave. This wave here has a larger amplitude than the other wave. So the blue wave is not quite twice the amplitude of the pink or red wave, but it is greater. So this has a greater amplitude than the original wave. And this is something that we're going to run into a little bit later on. This is amplitude modulation, or another name for amplitude modulation in radio is AM radio. So the way the uh, modulation comes through is by, ampli by modifying the height of the actual wave. Waves can also be described in relation to time. As we mentioned before, the waves have a certain length. And one wavelength can be considered the distance from peak to peak. But this can also be described as a function of time. So one peak to one peak can be described as one cycle. Or the period of a wave denoted by a capital T as a function of time. 
and one cycle per second is known as one hertz. And that is also equivalent to the frequency of the wave. And as we can kind of see from that relationship, an increased frequency of a wave means that there will be a decrease in wavelength. And as the frequency gets lower or decreases, the wavelength will increase. The last property of waves we're going to cover is phase angle. So we can see by this representation of a little more than one full wavelength. So one wavelength would start here and end here. And as we can see, it starts with zero point or zero degrees, and then a quarter wavelength will go to 90 degrees, and then back down to 180 degrees, and this will represent half a wavelength. So half a wavelength is 180 degree shift in phase angle, and then we see three quarters of wavelength is 270 degrees, and finally the completion of a full wavelength represents 360 degrees on a circle. So let's say we have another wave that starts right here at the 90 degree point. Again, forgive my drawing. And this will go down and represent a completion of one wavelength 90 degrees out of phase. So you can see that this wave started 90 degrees or a quarter wavelength different than the original blue wave. So this distance here represents a 90 degree shift in phase angle. So we can say that the yellow wave is 90 degrees out of phase of the blue wave. So now that we have a basic understanding of radio waves and their properties, we can categorize radio waves into the electromagnetic spectrum. And they're essentially broken down into um, a spectrum categorized by their wavelength or by their frequency. So as an example, the AF or audio frequency, what the human hearing can hear is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. Above 20 kilohertz, we get into the RF or radio frequency realm of the electromagnetic spectrum. As an example, we can look at broadcast radio. So an AM broadcast radio range is usually 500 kilohertz to maybe the upper 1.6, 1 1.7 1 uh, megahertz range. And as you can see, based on your knowledge that you gained in the lecture so far, these radio waves are rather long and they have a relatively low frequency. Above the AM broadcast, bands, we get into the ham, HF, or high frequency bands, and that is going to be from 3 to 30 megahertz. So this will be, this is a potential question on your technician exam, so remember that 3 to 30 megahertz range for the HF band for ham radio. Above 30 megahertz, um, there still exists ham frequencies, so from 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz is the VHF range, or the VHF band, the very high frequency band. And this has ham radio frequencies, television frequencies, FM broadcast stations, and also aviation frequencies. 
And as we know, the FM broadcast frequencies are anywhere from maybe 97 uh, megahertz or a little bit lower, uh, even in the upper 80s to the low 100s or so. And above that is the uh, aviation frequency. So you actually listen to air traffic control and uh, aircraft communicating with uh, ground control or uh, with even with each other. Above 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz is the UHF uh, band or the ultra high frequency. Ham still have privileges within this band, but again, it's shared with other uh, communities. And the television broadcast stations are located on here. Uh, again, this is a band where there's a lot of mobile phone activity and also your wireless routers at home that run your uh, internet at your house. Above the one gigahertz is considered microwave frequencies. So you can, that may be on the exam as well. So just remember above one gigahertz is the microwave realm. Above three gigahertz is the super high frequency and the extremely high frequency or SHF or EHF range where mobile phones still exist, uh, Wi Fi signals exist, and there's a lot of satellite communication and also radio astronomy. Beyond this, as we get into shorter frequencies and, um, I'm sorry, uh, higher frequencies and shorter wavelength, you get into infrared light. So infrared light, heat, and then with increasing frequency and decreasing wavelength, you start getting into visible light. And then after visible light, you start getting into the UV or ultraviolet light range uh, that can potentially damage skin. These are your kind of tanning spas and also UV light from the sun. And then beyond UV light, you start getting into X-rays and then finally uh, into gamma rays. So ultraviolet light, X-ray, and gamma rays are considered ionizing radiation. All types of electromagnetic radiation or, or the spectrum is considered radiation. However, there's a, a significant difference. This is high energy. These are high energy waves in the UV, X-ray, and gamma range and are considered ionizing radiation, which can cause damage to human cells dependent on the wavelength, duration of exposure, and also the intensity of exposure. And this is a nice depiction from courtesy of NASA. I found this on the web of the electromagnetic spectrum. As you can see, all the way to the left, you have AM radio. And that's in the 10 to the second power range. And then you get into radio waves, FM radio, cell phone, microwave, and then more infrared light, and then finally visible light. And... Uh, then you start getting into the more potent uh, uh, energy and potential ionizing radiation with ultraviolet light to the right, x-rays, and finally gamma waves. And they did a nice job of actually depicting uh, frequency and wavelength for this slide. Okay, we're going to start doing some examples. And what the book wants you to know is that uh, there's an equation to calculate wavelength. But if you know frequency, you can calculate wavelength. And if you know wavelength, you can calculate frequency. So the equation they'd like you to memorize is lambda, which is equal to wavelength. And lambda or the wavelength can be determined by dividing 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. And that will give you the wavelength in meters. So you can also do some simple math and rearranging. And instead of uh, doing lambda, you can get the frequency in megahertz by dividing 300 
by the wavelength in meters or lambda. So that's shorthand notation. But if you really want to understand what you're doing, uh, you remember that this equation can be shortened to c, which is the speed of light in meters per second over frequency in hertz. And as we remember, the speed of light designated by c is 300 million meters per second. So let's use what we've learned to calculate the wavelength if we have a frequency of 100 megahertz. And we want to know what lambda is or the wavelength. So to do that, we know that lambda is going to be equal to the speed of light in meters per second. So that's again 300 million meters in one second. And we want to divide that by the frequency. And as stated above, the frequency is 100 megahertz. So that's 100 million, one, two, three, four, five, six hertz. Or if you want to write in cycles per second, that's going to be easier for us to cross out the units. So what do we have here? We have seconds that cancel out, and we're left with meters per cycle, and that's going to give us the uh, wavelength. So we see we have all these excess zeros that we can cancel out top to bottom. So there are six zeros on top that can cancel out with six zeros on the bottom. And then if we simplify things, we're left with 300 over 100. And that's going to be equal to 3 meters. So lambda, based on the longhand calculations, which is a little more understandable in my opinion, is going to give you a wavelength of 3 meters for your 100 megahertz frequency. Okay, let's do another example to calculate the wavelength. This time, let's do a 2 gigahertz frequency, and we want to know what lambda is. And as you remember, lambda is going to be equal to the speed of light or a radio wave. And that, again, is 3 million meters per second. Put parentheses around that, and then we want to divide that by the frequency of 2 gigahertz. So instead of writing 2 gigahertz, we're going to write out uh, the frequency in hertz. So 2 gigahertz is going to be a very long number. So 2 followed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 cycles per second, or hertz. And again, we see that the seconds cancel out, and we can get rid of a whole bunch of zeros here. So let's, why don't we just get rid of 6 on top and 6 on the bottom to cancel out. And then this equation is going to simplify to 300 meters over 2,000 cycles. So that's going to give you 0 0.15 
meters. And as you know, there we can simplify that even further. 0 0.15 meters. And there are 100 centimeters in one meter. So we see meters cancel out and we're left with 15 centimeters as our final wavelength. So for 2 gigahertz frequency that translates into a 15 centimeter wavelength. So for our third example we're going to have a known wavelength of 20 meters. So lambda is going to equal 20 meters, but we want to know what the frequency is. So as we went over before, we can rearrange the equation and that the frequency in hertz is going to equal same thing, the speed of light or radio signal, 3 million meters per second. And we want to divide that by the wavelength in meters. So that's 20 meters. And there's one cycle in 20 meters. That's one wavelength. And we can see again that meters cancel out and that we're left with the frequency in hertz of a rather large number. So that's going to be equal to 15 million cycles per second. But we can simplify that into megahertz. Since we know that in 1 megahertz there are 1 million hertz, and again we cancel out a whole bunch of zeros, so 6 on top, 6 in the bottom, and you're left with 15 megahertz. So for a 20 meter wavelength you have a frequency of 15 megahertz. So in your amateur radio career you're going to come across something called harmonics. And harmonics are essentially multipliers of a certain frequency. So let's say you start off with a frequency of 5 megahertz or 10 kilohertz or uh, 30 gigahertz, it really doesn't matter. But that one or first frequency you're dealing with is going to be called the fundam uh, fundamental frequency. So that's denoted as 1F right here. And any multiplier of that fundamental frequency is going to be known as the next harmonic. So the second harmonic is going to have twice the frequency as the first harmonic. And as you can see here in the diagram, that this frequency is approximately twice the frequency of the uh, fundamental frequency as drawn. I'm not the best artist, so uh, forgive me for that. And the third harmonic is going to be three times the fundamental frequency. And again, you can see it down here as this should have three times the frequency as the fundamental frequency. These do vary in amplitude a little bit, but that's just due to my poor drawing skills. It has nothing to do with amplitude, only frequency. And for our last example, let's review harmonics. And as we know, there is a fundamental frequency, so that's just the frequency you are interested in. Let's say that frequency is going to be equal to 15 megahertz. 
I'm just going to be F1. So what's the second harmonic? So this is pretty simple stuff. So the second harmonic is going to be equal to 2 times F1 and 2 times 15 is 30. So the second harmonic from the fundamental frequency of 15 megahertz is 30 megahertz. And the third harmonic is equal to 3 times the fundamental frequency, or F1, and that's going to be equal to 45 megahertz. And we'll get into this later on and see why the uh, fundamental frequencies and harmonics are important in amateur radio. But as you can see, it's a pretty simple calculation. And in the last part of this lecture, we're going to get into radio station basics. We're going to start with uh, a normal home radio station. The normal home radio station consists of an antenna, a feed line, which is the part that connects the actual radio to the antenna, a transmitter, a receiver, and also a transmit-receive switch. Radios can just be receivers on their own without transmitters, or they can actually be transmitters without receivers in certain circumstances. So in this slide, we're just going to depict what we covered on the previous slide. So a basic radio station is essentially a few components. So you have the transmitter here, you have a transmit and receive switch and you have a receiver component here and of course all these are found in a single uh, unit or a single box um, the transmit and receiver have to have an antenna obviously to transmit the signal and receive the signal and that antenna is hooked up to the unit by what's called the feed line and this feed line can be coaxial cable or it could be ladder line. So the basic radio setup can't transmit and receive at the same time. Uh, that's going to be reserved for something such as a repeater with a duplexer, which we'll get into shortly. There are other radio stations that can essentially receive and transmit simultaneously. These are very common in repeater stations, and repeater stations are commonly found in the FM uh, amateur bands where uh, people will talk on a frequency and the repeater will repeat their signal and retransmit it uh, to another station. So the ability to receive and transmit simultaneously is known as duplex communication. The basic repeater or duplex station has a transmitter and a receiver just like a basic radio station has, but it also has what's called a duplexer, which allows that uh, station to transmit and receive simultaneously. And of course, the station has an antenna and feed line. So a repeater station is going to be somewhat different. It's going to have something called a duplexer, along with the typical transmitter and the typical receiver with an antenna and the feed line, be it coax or ladder line, that's hooked up to the entire unit. What's different about the repeater is that it can operate in duplex, meaning it can receive and transmit at the same time. The frequencies are typically uh, offset by, on FM repeaters, maybe around 600 kilohertz. So the receiver might receive a signal uh, at a certain frequency, then retransmit that signal either 600 kilohertz above the original frequency or 600 kilohertz below that frequency, and that's referred to as the offset. Okay, everyone, that about wraps up the lecture, and we hope you learned a lot. Have fun, 73, and we'll see you in the next lecture.